under the Q&A is... Uh, the Q&A is uh, after all the talks. The next talk is called uh, Temporal Set Inversion for Animated Releases. And it's going to be presented by uh, Kawashi Azar, and it's from Kawashi Azar and Paul Cry. Temporal set inversion for one moment, please. <laughs> Good one. There we go. All right. Temporal set inversion for animated implicits. So, what is set inversion? So essentially, we have this function n that maps from points in R n to points in R m, and we have this set y in R m that we want to find the pre-image of under f in Rn. And so this set we call x is the pre-image of y, and we write it as f inverse notation. So, so, why do we care about this? Well, root finding, and indeed isosurface extraction, is just a special case of set inversion, where f is a scalar function, and the set we're trying to invert is just the set to zero. So we want to find the set of points that map to zero. So, how do we currently do this in computer graphics? Well, one popular technique is ray tracing. And this is nice because it takes this full 3D root finding problem and it simplifies it down to the 1D root finding problem of finding the closest route along all the rays that you shoot into the scene, which is nice because it's fast. But it has no memory. And so, in every frame, if either your surface moves or your camera moves, you have to redo this whole finding procedure, and that's not ideal. Let's go full screen for this. Right, so the alternative is to do some sort of world space discretization. This might be running marching cubes to get a mesh, or building an ASDF or some sort of lock tree. And this is, in general, extremely slow. It's usually cubic in the resolution because we're in 3D, and it's not ideal. But once your discretization is built, it's extremely fast to render, right? You just rasterize some triangles or you do some octree traversal, it's very fast. And so if your scene is static, this is fantastic. You just build this thing once and then you're good to go. But what if it's not? What if f is actually a function of time? And now in this case, you really don't want to be rediscretizing your whole scene in every frame. And so naturally you might be asking, what if we could just re-render the moving bits? If you stare at some of these animations, you might notice that the moving bits are sometimes quite sparse. So, that's indeed our goal. We wish to build and maintain some sort of approximation of X that is within delta of the ground truth. And we want to update this thing only as and where is necessary to maintain some sort of error invariant. So conceptually this is very simple, but how do we actually do it? So first, some background on interval arithmetic. This is essentially an automatic technique for bounding the range of a function over some input domain. In our case this can be a box, uh, which is essentially the Cartesian product of n intervals, where an interval is just the set of reals between two endpoints. And via operator overloading, we can bound the range of basically any f over a box of Rn by this notation, f of b, where b is a, a box. So, once we have interval arithmetic, it's very easy to do root finding. Essentially, we just apply this rule where if zero is not contained in the image of some interval, then the interval cannot contain a root. So immediately, we can run this example in one dimension where we're trying to root find this red function, basically find these two points, and we subdivide the uh, input domain, we reevaluate with interval arithmetic, we proceed along until we find an interval where the image does not intersect this blue line. And so we've essentially proven that this region cannot contain a root, we delete it and move on. This region may contain a root, we subdivide. This region cannot, we delete it, we subdivide, <coughs> subdivide, subdivide, and so on. And very quickly, we converge to the roots. So, in higher dimensions, this algorithm is called CIVIA, or the Set Inverter by Interval Analysis by Luke Jialin from 1993. And 
in higher dimensions, it partitions the search space into three sets of boxes. These are called subpavings, p in, p out, and p i, that enclose the boundary of the set x. And so if we just step through this animation where we subdivide in two dimensions, we eventually converge to the boundary of the surface. So this is the standard interval subdivision algorithm, and this is the ground truth that we're trying to uh, approximate. So for time varying f, we need to update these Civia solutions. So essentially, suppose I have some Civia solution at some time t old, and I want the Civia solution at some new time t now. And in between, I'm willing to allow the field to change by up to some temporal error tolerance, let's call it delta. So how do we actually measure change in the field over a box of space over an interval of time? Well, it's actually very easy. We just use first-order error analysis. And with automatic differentiation combined with interval arithmetic, we can evaluate the time derivative of f over a box of space over an interval of time to get this measure delta f. So, so with that, we can implement temporal civium. And basically what this does is in each frame, we're going to attempt to recursively rebuild our octree using civia, but with one key exception, we are not going to recurse into the boxes over which insufficient change has occurred. Insufficient meaning less than delta. So this requires some extra bookkeeping, basically we need to keep track of the accumulated error within each box, also the time of last reevaluation. But it's not too big a deal. So you implement this, and now you get your nice error invariant. So I won't explain exactly what this is saying, but essentially, we can rigorously bound the error between the minus delta and delta isosurfaces. So delta controls basically the thickness of your error layer. And outside of it, guaranteed to be correct or <coughs> identical to the Civia solution. But there's a small complication. Well, there's many, but I'll share one of them with you. One is that for performance reasons, we're using a single evaluation of f over this box over this interval of time for two different sort of competing purposes. One purpose of this evaluation, this interval that we get, is to measure the change in the field over this time interval, and at the same time, do root finding on the function at the end of the time interval. And so, for slow moving things, this works very well. But for fast moving things, you often get this false positive case, where in your box, you may have had a root at the start of the time interval, but not at the end. And so the way this manifests is, if you have something that's moving extremely quickly, you get this ghost region that follows it around. If I pause this, this is your actual surface, and this is where the octree is still being subdivided, but there's actually nothing there that there was in the previous frame. So how do we fix this? Uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh, our fix was to just threshold delta f and say if delta f is too high above some other parameter, kappa, we're just going to abandon the time interval evaluation altogether and do instant evaluations just to check if there's anything still there at the end of the time interval. And so this uh, essentially fixes the problem. And if you start this long enough, you'll realize what it's trying to tell you is that at the highest levels of the octree, you know, the big boxes, we're evaluating f many times and accumulating some error. And only once this reaches our threshold do we propagate that down and evaluate the smaller boxes. And occasionally in between, we do these instant evaluations that show up as these white boxes. So this uh, handles the problem quite well. So, onto some results. Uh, here we have uh, our main test scene, which is sort of uh, the intended use case for algorithm, where in the top left you see the ground truth, and then the three other ones, you, these are at the different delta values. So point 0.1 has the fewest artifacts, point 0.06 uh, has the most, but it's also the fastest. So at point 0.1 we get a 72x speed up, or a 126, or a 194. So it's quite good. Here the motion is quite sparse. Um, oh, and the, the visualization, by the way, uh, the voxels colored red are the ones that are being evaluated in each frame. So the time savings comes from all the gray stuff that we're not spending time on. Of course, the ground truth is like uh, doing the full evaluation which is uh, not as fast. So here at 0.06, it uh, doesn't look very good. Uh, there's another test scene by uh, Inig, I forget who made the scene, but uh, you can read the paper, it's all in there. Uh, here we get a 7x speed up at 
These are all at 1024 cubed arcture resolution. There's another test scene. These are all in the, uh, the paper as well. So, another cool thing we can do, there's various extensions we have to our algorithm. One is we can do these bounded error swept volumes, which are very cool. These are very fast because we're not reevaluating the full scene and like unioning it with itself every frame. We're just sort of evaluating this moving frontier. And to do this, uh, it's a small tweak to our algorithm. You basically just disable the voxel deallocations and some other stuff to keep it rigorous. And so these are guaranteed to be whole free uh, and smooth and, and all of this stuff that, uh, that you want. So, in conclusion, your runtime with our algorithm is now a function of the moving surface area of your frame. And so the more mostly static stuff you have in your scene, the better your runtime will be. And so this is actually quite common if you're, let's say, 3D modeling, you're gonna have some complicated shape and modifying just some small part of it, or in a game where you have a big level with small characters running around. So uh, the code and everything is available here, and uh, thank you very much. Very energetic though. <laughs> I'm trying to go fast, you know, there's a lot of stuff to get through. I guess that's the, in the title, a couple of times. Uh, we can have the next speaker. <laughs> so, uh, the, next, the next talk is about the real-time radiance fields for... Was I in time? I wasn't time. For radiance fields.